All right, it is five o'clock. I think we'll go ahead and jump right in. I'm Celeste, the Administrative Coordinator for the Equality State Policy Center. Welcome to the People's Review Live, hosted by us, ESPC. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization working to improve the lives of Wyoming's people through transparent government, fair elections, and thriving communities. The People's Review Live is designed to help people across the state engage with our government and keep with keep up with important issues and debates. When we work together, we can ensure transparent government, fair elections, and thriving communities. And that has never been more important than right now. This event is made possible through our generous supporters of the People's Review Live Circle members, Marsha Constell and Joe Albright, Joanne Skyam True, and Jane True, and Mike Shanzi, and Kathy Jenkins, and an anonymous donor. If you'd like to know how to become part of our Leadership Circle, leadership circle member, please email me. You can find my email in the chat shortly. Um, and then I'd just like to share a couple housekeeping things. Um, this is in the webinar format. So our attendees are just seeing our beautiful faces um, and hearing us. And then you guys can submit any questions via chat, um, chat or Q&A as we move forward. And we'll get to those the best we can throughout the evening. And then I'd just like to say that this is recorded to ensure that we can view it later and go over any important things that come up. If you're having any technical difficulties, um, not hearing us or seeing us, well, go ahead and drop me a line in the chat and we'll try our best. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to our ESPC Executive Director, Jen Lowe, to introduce the evening speakers. Thank you so much, Celeste, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we have an impressive panel of speakers and I am excited to get started. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them. First, we have Representative Mike Yen. Mike Yen represents the residents of Jackson. Currently in his second term, Representative Yen currently sits on the Management Council, the Joint Corporations, Elections and Political Subdivisions Committee, the Judiciary Committee, Revenue Committee, Rules and Procedure Committee, and the Select Committee on Blockchain, Financial Technology, and Digital Innovation Technology. He also works full-time as a software developer, writing code for mobile apps. While being raised by immigrant parents in Georgia, he grew up watching his parents contribute and serve their adopted communities. He knew then that he would one day serve his own community. Representative Yin is the first Chinese American to serve in the Wyoming legislature and enjoys snowboarding when he is not in session. Here's hoping we get a little more snow for you, Representative Yin. Gail Simons is proud to be a fourth generation Wyomingite. Her family has been a Sheridan County Ag family since before Wyoming was even a state. After graduating from the University of Wyoming, her first career was serving as a U.S. Navy officer with responsibilities ranging from retail operations, program management, and budgeting. A second career at General Electric included the Six Sigma program, marketing and logistics. Gail returned to her full-time hometown of Sheridan in 2016, where her passion for community service and civics has been the foundation of a third career. She was appointed by Governor Meade to the Commission on Efficiency in State Government, and she serves on the Transparency Working Group established by Governor Gordon and Auditor Racinus. She publishes Civic 307, a nonpartisan blog, providing readers with greater visibility to the Wyoming legislative process. Gail holds a Bachelor's of Science in Marketing from the University of Wyoming and an MBA with emphasis on organization behavior from the University of Hawaii, Manoa. And finally, Helen Brewer. As legal analyst for the Electoral Innovation Lab and Princeton Gerrymandering Project, Helen analyzes newly proposed redistricting maps and tracks redistricting litigation to understand the rapidly changing landscape of the law and on the ground impact of redistricting. She examines the intersection of judicial precedent and election laws throughout the country to understand what legal challenges reform efforts might face. Helen also works with state and local community partners to identify ways that the Electoral Innovation Lab can support their work with legal and policy research. Prior to joining the EIL and Princeton Gerrymandering Project, Helen interned with the National Conference of State Legislatures, Kaplan and Drysdale's Political Law Group, and the US Department of Education. Helen received her JD from William and Mary Law School and holds an undergraduate degree in history from the University of Northern Colorado, where she also studied anthropology and political science. Thank you all for being here tonight. I know that everybody is just busy getting ready for redistricting and uh, budget session, but I appreciate your time. So now let's just go ahead and get to the good stuff. The 2022 Wyoming State Budget Session convenes this Monday, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. 
The session lasts four weeks and legislators will be charged with approving a budget, a legislative map, and potentially several other pieces of legislation. I'd like to start this conversation by chatting about redistricting. Representative Yen serves on the Joint Corporations Committee that has been charged with preparing the maps and leading the redistricting effort. I'm gonna start with you. Representative Yen, can you briefly summarize what redistricting is and how it impacts Wyoming residents? Sure, yeah, so every 10 years we have a new national census. Um, well, thank you again for inviting me, first of all. And I appreciate being here. I think um, this is good for just everyone to have like a little educational opportunity and a, a way to also get involved and answer, get questions answered on what the process looks like. Um, so we have a census every every 10 years. That's the um, official count of uh, basically where everyone lives in the United States. And for Wyoming, we have to do a re, uh, re it's, it's I, I guess the official term is reapportionment which is to reapportion um, the population of Wyoming into the number of legislative districts um, so that you have a reasonably equal amount of power between each elector. Um, and what that means in essence is that uh, it's the principle of one person, one vote, where your representation in Cheyenne in the legislature is approximately equal to the person who lives in Lusk or the person who lives in Jackson, and that they all have equal representation in the legislature. It also pertains to congressional reapportionment, but we only have one that large district, so we only tackle the state legislative districts and reapportionment every 10 years. You know, and as a follow-up question, can you kind of explain some of the unique qualities that make redistricting more challenging in the state of Wyoming? Um, so it, it can be a little unique in Wyoming because it is a super majority uh, one party state for, uh, for a lot of portions in Wyoming. So a lot of the arguments don't tend to be, be between parties, it tends to be between communities, um, and especially as a very low population state, um, it, it can, uh, you can have districts that are, are very large in land area. And um, it's trying to ensure that um, there is good representation um, as well as equal representation. One term that kind of keeps coming up throughout this process, you know, let me take a step back real quick and um, thank you, Senator Nethercott, for joining us. I know everybody is so busy getting ready for committee meeting tomorrow in session. So I do appreciate you joining us. Um, everybody can read her bio in the link. I'm, I'm gonna skip that part right now, but we can come back to it. Um, you know, the term, a term that comes up quite a bit when we're talking about redistricting is gerrymandering. Um, Helen has specialized in this area and I'd like to her, I would like you, Helen, to kind of explain what gerrymandering is and how it impacts the redistricting process. Sure. So like Representative Ian said as well, I'm also very happy to be here with you all tonight. Um, certainly, I'm honored to be here with such distinguished co-panelists. And also on a personal note, as Jen said, I am born and raised in Colorado and did my bachelor's at UNC just down in Greeley. So even though I'm now based all the way out in the Princeton area in New Jersey, I'm very excited to be here with you all. So gerrymandering, Representative Yin again gave us a great description of redistricting. Gerrymandering is sort of the, the dark side of redistricting, if you will. So gerrymandering is the practice of manipulating those district lines that Representative Yin told us about for some sort of unfair advantage. So generally, when we're talking about gerrymandering, we are talking about either partisan or racial gerrymandering. Unfortunately, we see both of these things occur in all different states across the country. And I also think it's important to note that we see both political parties attempting to enact gerrymanders, again, in states all across the country. Whichever party is in power in any given state, we oftentimes see them incentivized to draw maps that will entrench their own power as opposed to maps that might take other things into consideration that are more fair for citizens. So it's not a one party thing. It's not a one state thing. This is an issue we see um, all over all over the country during redistricting every cycle. So. 
Quickly, I'll just talk about the, the ways that gerrymandering can be affected, sort of the, the tactics that map makers might use if they're trying to gerrymander. Usually when we talk about this, you might've heard the terms packing and cracking. So packing, um, you know, we can take sort of the hypothetical example of a partisan gerrymander, but again, this applies in the context of partisan and racial gerrymandering. In packing, you can imagine if you have a two-party system, which of course we do, if one party is in power and currently holds a majority in the state legislature, they might attempt to take a lot of residents in a certain area who vote for the other party, who belong to the other party, and draw a really large majority of these folks into a single district. So in that district, you know, it might be 86% or some, some really large number majority for that party. And so in that district, that party will be able to you know, elect essentially its representative of choice almost all of the time. But then when packing is being affected in the other surrounding districts, the party in power, the majority party will be able to parcel out the remaining few members of the, the other party, the minority party that's been packed into the, to the one district and fill those surrounding districts with members of the majority party to guarantee that that party will win more seats uh, than perhaps might otherwise be suggested by the natural sort of geography or distribution of those voters. So cracking is a little bit maybe self-explanatory in light of the packing explanation, but it's a similar concept where you might imagine if you have a certain area of a state with lots of members of one party, but that's maybe not the party that's in control of the state legislature, then the party in control might fragment those voters up into several different districts where their numbers are too low to uh, have a chance at electing their representative of choice and their voices will be drowned out by the, the other party. And again, I use the hypothetical of partisan gerrymandering there, but those are the same tactics that we see when we're looking at racial gerrymanders. So that's kind of a, a whirlwind explanation. It's usually nice to do with some visuals, but hopefully, hopefully it makes sense. No, it does. Thank you very much. It is a very complex issue, and especially in a state in Wyoming where we are predominantly one party state. Um, some of the issues that we're facing are slightly different. Senator Nethercott has been serving on this committee since the beginning of this process. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with this redistricting process, what, um, what you've learned and, and what you've seen through throughout the different committee meetings? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me tonight um, and, and appreciate the the grace afforded me for a, a late arrival. So it's been a tough interim uh, working on redistricting, which of course we knew it would be, it always is. And so it's important, I think, to recognize that all across the country um, and historically, the process of redistricting is, is difficult, it's challenging, and it does um, result in kind of inherent conflicts as a result of change and the fear of loss um, for those areas that might uh, experience a loss in population or other concerns that would result in a change of a district. Uh, so, you know, not surprisingly, as a result of that continuity throughout the years, every 10 years across the country, Wyoming has experienced the same. So I would describe the process as um, conflicted and arduous and, uh, you know, frustrating at times. And, and it still is, you know, as, as everyone knows and, and the viewers likely know we have a redistricting meeting tomorrow still the Friday before session begins on Monday to just show how kind of um, intense this work is and how much more time we need. Of course the committee received the census numbers late um, than we normally would uh, resulting in the loss of months of, of available time for the committee to do good work. That certainly put us behind and then uh, the legislature uh, convened a special session in October uh, concerning um, vaccine mandates and, and other uh, issues affecting the country and the state at that time. And so that further interfered with the, the committee's ability to really be in the heart and the bulk of redistricting process. So it's been challenging with that uh, heated time frame, uh, distracted concerns, and um, the inherent challenges associated with redistricting. Thank you for that. Gail, I know that you have watched this process pretty closely. I've seen you at most of these committee meetings. I'd like to hear about your perspective on the work. And also, if you could just give us a quick update on the map that is currently being supported at the committee. 
Well, uh, as, as with the others, uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, it's, it, it's kind of uh, being a great spe spectator to this sport of um, sausage making uh, that is uh, legislation. Uh, so one of the things that uh, as a, an outsider that I, could, I feel comfortable observing is that corporations has always been one of the most um, professional and uh, experienced of all the committees. Uh, they have always had a very even hand. They've, all, they, they've really been um, one of the most professional of all the, the committees. So from a personal standpoint, um, I've, I've found this very disappointing and that um, it, it, there, it, it kind of devolved into an understandable but still disappointing parochialism. Um, and while it's understandable, uh, it, it really doesn't serve the, the, the committee, the legislature, or the people of the state uh, when individuals or areas dig their feet in and uh, basically re refuse to play in the sandbox. And, and that really caused a, a lot of the problems. Um, I'll, just, I'll just call out one, for example, um, in Laramie County, uh, which was the uh, largest growing in, in population, grew almost an entire house seat. And in order to, to make that work, from a mathematical standpoint, it meant that, that Laramie County should have 10 and a half representatives, which means that somebody, some other county needs to share in order to make it an even number. And it very quickly came into, no, we don't wanna play with them. And, and now it's at, oh, all this is being caused by Laramie County and they're being greedy when no, it was, it was people didn't want to, to, to work together. Uh, so I, I just found that personally disappointing simply because uh, my expectations and my experience with, with corporations has been really the highest level. So uh, the, the change in population for the overall state from, from 2020 to 2030, on the whole, only changed by 1,095 people. It went up. The problem that they've got, uh, that the legislature and the, the committee has, is that it's, that was not an even growth. We had Laramie, uh, Laramie County was the largest growth of 8,774. That's almost an entire house. Carbon County lost 13,500 people. That is a representative and a half. And so you look along the I-80 corridor and you have at, at one end and, and the middle, you've got carbon losing one and a half and you have Cheyenne gaining a half. And that really was a part of the dynamics. These very, these smaller and more rural counties who were resisting the fact that the Supreme Court has stated um, the you know one person one vote so it becomes a math issue math uh, problem and of course that doesn't take into account personalities and political dynamics and and uh, a a belief that is unfounded and has no legal basis that um, counties are uh, sovereign just like the state is sovereign. So I, I like to tell folks, this is not the United Counties of Wyoming. It, we, it's the United States of America and Wyoming is sovereign, but the counties are a function of the legislature. There are, it's a creature of the, of the legislature. So, um, so that's kind of my perspective. I'm, I'm hoping, I think that, uh, I know that Sheridan and Johnson County are very unhappy with the 6231. And part of the reason is that there's a, there's a great difficulty in elections when they have what they call split ballots. And with the 6030, 
there's only one split ballot, and that is due to an island, if you will, of a um, incorporated into the into Sheridan City that is off by itself. With the 6231, the best they could do was to get it down to five split ballots. And that's really problematic. Uh, so I should let viewers know, and I'm assuming that you do, that the current map that the committee is supporting uh, would increase the size of the legislature by three. It would add two seats to the House and one to the Senate. Uh, this proposed map meets most of the committee's um, standards, and it also keeps all those districts within compliance of plus or minus 5% of the ideal population to be represented per district. One of the ways that some states have addressed the redistricting process is through some sort of independent redistricting commission. Helen, can you sort of talk about how those work and how other states have utilized them to redistrict? Sure. So independent redistricting commissions are growing. Um, more and more states have them this cycle than have had them in past cycles. So there are a few different ways that these commissions work. So I'm gonna try to briefly and clearly run through a good, a good selection of them. So usually when somebody's talking about an independent redistricting commission, what we would consider a truly independent commission is a commission that does not have any elected officials. It doesn't have any legislators on it. Um, it's going to be made up of citizens, perhaps some folks who are registered Republicans, some who are registered Democrats, and some who are independents or unaffiliated. Again, that varies a lot by state, which I can I can talk more about. Um, but some examples of states with these, I guess these these most independent commissions, Colorado and Michigan, both have independent citizens commissions that are brand new this cycle. They were uh, passed into law within the last few years. California and Arizona also have these independent commissions and their commissions have been around, uh, been around for a little while. They're not new this cycle. So the commissions in those states, they have the authority, whatever maps they pass will be enacted into law. There are some states that have independent commissions, but they're advisory, meaning that they don't have the authority to enact their maps into law. So they can pass maps and essentially they send them to the legislature or the governor, although I think these it, they all go to the legislature in these states and the legislature can take them under advisement, perhaps will approve them, perhaps won't. And states with this model include New Mexico, New York, and Utah. So there are a couple of states, Ohio is actually a, a prominent example that has a redistricting commission, but it is entirely made up of elected officials. And I think you know anybody who follows redistricting perhaps has seen that the maps coming out of that commission, they've been struck down by the state Supreme Court multiple times now, actually. So that's it's a commission, but it's made up entirely of elected leaders. And so we see a sharp difference in how that commission has functioned this cycle in comparison to the independent commissions in states like Colorado and Michigan. Then I think another very useful example is Virginia's new redistricting commission. So like I said, that's another one that's new this cycle. It was enacted, passed into law in the last few years. And the Virginia commission was made up mostly of citizens, but it did have a few elected officials on the commission. And the way that that commission um, you know, ended up handling this cycle has been a very useful case study. I think they they were able to produce a wide variety of different draft maps for the state for congressional and legislative, although of course in Wyoming, the, the, it's all about the state legislative districts. Um, but the Virginia Commission was able to produce a lot of different suggested draft maps. They performed in, you know, with varying degrees of fairness, looking at the many different ways to analyze the fairness of a map. But ultimately in the end, the commission came to partisan loggerheads, broke down around uh, or broke down along partisan lines and was unable to pass its maps. And so I think that's just a useful example as perhaps other states begin to consider moving forward with commissions or some of these states maybe attempt to reform their commissions to think about the differences we've seen this cycle, which have been really apparent of independent citizen commissions so far seem to have had much more success passing fair maps than commissions that have closer ties to elected officials or perhaps have 
elected officials sitting on the commissions. And there are a lot of nuances within all these different states examples that I've just mentioned, but I can stop there for now. I know there's lots of other, other information to get to here, but I can, you know, you can let me know if there's anything else you'd like me to get into. Thank you so much, Helen. And I highly recommend that you check out the Princeton Gerrymandering um, website if you haven't. They've done a great job of compiling information about um, how states' processes are going along and um, it's been very helpful to me, so thank you. Um, you know, much like the budget session, we have a lot to cover on this call, so I'd like to move on to talking about the budget. Um, Representative Yin, you serve on the Revenue Committee. Can you tell us a bit about your work on that committee and how it relates to the budget process? So the Revenue Committee specifically is generally tasked with, uh, specifically generally, is tasked with um, determining our current revenue sources in Wyoming, as well as what are other possible revenue sources um, that would be possible for the legislature to enact. So the budget is um, specifically done by the Joint Appropriations Committee. So there is a tie-in kind of between the two in that funds that can be spent have to be essentially revenue, right? And, uh, but with the revenue committee, it's more of a longer term picture of what do the, what does the incoming revenue look like in a, a further out timeline while the budget is, is basically what are we doing these next two years or how we're spending what, what we anticipate the current revenue to be. And to follow up on that question, um, I know that there was an influx of federal revenue this year, can you talk a little bit about those funds and, and where they're at in the process? Yeah, so there, there is um, the budget bill, which is handled by JAC, the Joint Appropriations Committee, and then the uh, there's an ARPA bill that's specifically for the American Rescue Plan Act funds. And that bill, I believe, just got posted today. And I don't, um, I think it came out of, uh, Cap Finn, which is a select committee. Um, let me see right now. Appropriations. Oh, it did come out of appropriations. That's correct. It, but however, each each committee, um, each of our, our standing committees, both all looked into what are the kinds of things that we can get in, in, into ARPA funds. And so some of that has been rolled in, into this big bill. And then there are still some um, special bills for specific parts of ARPA um, and how we could best utilize those federal funds. Thank you. Senator Nethercott, I would like to hear your thoughts on this uh, governor's proposed budget and also some of your priorities for the budget this year. Yeah, so I think consistent with what has been reported about the governor's budget, it's I think it's been described as being pretty flat. Um, so nothing particularly remarkable and quite conservative despite the amount of monies that the state has received um, from the ARPA funds and how well really our investment earnings are doing. Wyoming is still in a state of struggle when it comes to revenue sources. We do not have a stable revenue source right now um, since we have always relied upon uh, the commodity industry, right? Fossil fuels primarily, which are certainly in a state of, of constant volatility and fluctuation. So that problem persists. Um, and the way that we have leveled that out historically is through our strong investment funds. And so one of those primary investment funds is called the Permanent Mineral Trust Fund, appropriately named for um, where the source of Wyoming's revenue comes from. So I do support um, some of the efforts of the Appropriations Committee and the governor to make sure that the, the Permanent Mineral Trust Fund receives some of those additional monies so we can continue long-term investment growth. I also support efforts to create um, other additional trust funds. Um, and funding other current funds that we have with those uh, one-time ARPA funds so that we can continue to earn interest and uh, reap the benefits and rewards uh, from this one-time um, federal dollars that we have received. So I think that that's wonderful. I think, I think primarily in what is most notable uh, that the legislature is looking at it and it appears to have broad um, support somewhat surprisingly, but certainly necessarily, is for the increase in employee salaries, which I think uh, is long overdue. And we're, start, we're starting to see that crisis point come into play. 
Uh, the governor's budget, of course, only kind of reinstated some of the cuts that took place over the last couple of years. Um, so he he made that whole as, as at least for the last couple of years. And then the Appropriations Committee, uh, you know, in reliance on some of the studies coming in for employment, employee salaries uh, is is proposing an increase uh, across the board with some variation uh, for all state employees to receive an increase. Um, and so I, I do support that. I think it's necessary. I know I can, can get some feedback of being a Cheyenne legislator. So of course I support that. But fundamentally, I don't think that our state employees, which work tirelessly and, and are incredibly committed, are being compensated at a rate that allows uh, them to continue to stay in Wyoming and to continue to work as hard as they do. And, and it's just, it needs to be corrected as quickly as possible. Uh, Wyoming has some absolutely fantastic state employees, and I've had the chance to work with some of the staff at LSO, and um, they are an impressive bunch. So I'm glad that um, the legislature is recognizing that and the governor this year. So um, thank you. Um, Gail, I know that you've attended a lot of the Joint Appropriations Committee meetings. Um, can you kind of tell us a bit about your perspective as an outsider on the process? Uh, thank you. So I'm, I'm glad that they have, they're resisting um, kind of what we've seen in the past, which is, you know, spend money like a drunken sailor when we've got it, and then bemoan the loss when we don't. And, uh, and by the way, having been a sailor, I feel like I can use that expression. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that that they are, are staying with that flat budget that the uh, governor is recommending. And I also like his approach that he has taken with the additional funds that um, to, to have it be an investment. You know, when you treat kind of windfall funds uh, as, as if they're an ongoing revenue source, you, you really bind yourself up in the, in the future. Uh, but if you look at them as, as an opportunity for investment and to set up for the future, not just, not just spend it. So it becomes investment rather than expenditures. I, I think, and, and I, I, I think that's also um, very, very much the approach that our governor has always had, which is, that long-term view and investment and really sound fiscal policy. And uh, I think that, we, that we've come to rely on that, that experience that he has and, and that approach. And I wanna echo what the Senator said. Uh, my brother was um, a, a state employee and he used to joke about how many folks said, well, it's, a, it's an honor you know, that, that you get to, to work in Wyoming. And his response is, beautiful landscape doesn't put bread on the table. And so um, trying to slightly make up for that gap in salary is, is very critical. And the fact that the, we have the same number of people doing the, doing the same amount, or we have fewer people doing the same amount of work for a, an increasing gap is, is, a, is a real problem. Uh, and just like other things, when Wyoming, when people look at Wyoming and say, well, we have the highest number of government employees of, of any state. Well, what that does is that ignores the fact that you have a combination of fixed and variable costs. And to open the doors of the capital, to open the doors of our uh, executive branch, it takes a certain number of people, a certain amount of costs just to open the door. And it doesn't vary by the number of people in the state. So when we don't recognize the impact of, of fixed costs, and that, that's, that's also true in our education. You open a, a, a school, and before you have a single student come through, there's going to be costs. So um, I, I'm really, I, I think that the Appropriations Committee has done a good job, and I, I hope that they continue to do the good job they, they have in the past of educating the body, the rest of the, the legislators on the considerations that went into that budget. 
Thank you, Gail, very much. Um, I do have one more question that I would like to pose to both legislators. Um, I know we're a little bit late in the process. The session is starting on Monday um, and it's gonna be a whirlwind from there, but how can folks, um, how can Wyoming Knights still be involved in this process? Um, and I'll go ahead and start with Representative Ian. You know, I think I, 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 the chairman would, would probably, the, the chairwoman would probably know better than I would. Uh, I think we're still going to allow Zoom participation. Um, it, and, and that's probably the best way I know for my constituents who live all the way in Jackson to be able to participate. Um, just make sure that you sign up ahead of time. Um, you follow closely, especially with organizations uh, that support issues that you support um, to make sure that you are up to date on what is happening because it's 20 working days, which is extremely quick. Um, so stuff will happen very fast and um, writing your legislator, uh, and following specific bills, or just even reading the paper, um, I think is a really useful way of, of being able to follow and then being able to respond based on what you see is happening. And because it's 20 days, a lot can happen within those 20 days and a lot can also change within those 20 days. So it, it really is just um, follow along and jump in when you can. And the budget really is sort of a daunting document. I mean, it is, it's, significantly large. Um, Senator Nethercott, do you have any suggestions for folks, for folks that might want to learn more or be involved in this process? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I suggest reaching out to anyone that you know that's currently involved in the process. Uh, you know, Gail um, is is phenomenal and, and is more accessible than we are uh, during the legislative process. I'm sure her contact information is available for just tips on how to track and follow what's actually going on um, and how to engage. So Representative Yen is, is correct. We wanna hear from you. Um, we were elected because we wanna engage with our constituents. Um, so, you know, email is a great way. Um, and then public testimony is a great way. I would say, don't, don't necessarily call us. You're certainly welcome to, but we're not in a position to answer the telephone. Um, you know, because we're typically on the floor um, and, and engaged in the Capitol and not, not in a spot to take phone calls. So that's one kind of piece of information that I think sometimes the public isn't aware of. The Capitol can take phone call messages um, for us and bring them to us, but um, with, the, with, the, with email, it can be a, a little bit easier where we can substantively respond. But I would also say have reasonable expectations of your legislators as well. I know this probably isn't what anybody wants to hear, but don't be disappointed if during the session you don't necessarily hear back from a legislator or the response you get might be, you know, just a one sentence response and pretty short. Take note that they read your email. Take note that we do read your emails and we do care about what they say. But just due to the overwhelming process, we might not be able to substantively respond in a way that you find satisfactory. But, but know we care about you and care about what you have to share with us. Um, and your participation really can make a huge difference. Um, you know, every year, multiple times on multiple subjects, there seems to be a bill that will pass or will fail. And through the efforts of um, stakeholders and advocacy of constituents and kind of reaching out, that bill either dies or lives, right, depending on, on the outcome. And so it really can have an impact and a, a measurable outcome for legislation. Great. I'd love to hear some questions from the audience. If there's anybody watching here today that has any questions on the budget or redistricting up until this point, please jump in there. Uh, and in the meanwhile, I would like to point out that uh, Wyoming's legislators are citizen legislators. So not only are they doing the work that you've elected them to do, but they also have jobs and other responsibilities out of Cheyenne. So, you know, the fact that they do read your emails and get back to you as consistently as you do, um, kudos to you. Uh, okay, so we talked redistricting, we talked the budget. Um, I would like to shift to Medicaid expansion. Um, Quality State Policy Center has been deeply engaged in Healthy Wyoming and the efforts to expand Medicaid in Wyoming for several years. Polling, recent polling overwhelmingly shows that Wyomingites support Medicaid expansion and that cuts across party lines. Um, last year, a bill passed through the House historically that would have uh, gotten us a bit closer to Medicaid expansion. And recently a bill was supported in revenue committee to move on to the budget session. 
Um, we're not quite there. As we know, there's a lot of process involved. And I'm hoping, you know, Representative Yen, you can kind of talk us through the next steps um, of the bill that came through revenue and, and, and its chances of coming to the floor. Sure. I mean, specifically on the process. So this bill was a revenue committee sponsored bill. So the Joint Revenue Committee, both the House and the Senate side, met between sessions and decided that it would bring this Medicaid expansion bill again um, to the, the upcoming budget session. So you, we have a bill filed, I believe it's coming in on the House side. And uh, because it is a budget session, we have a, a, a constitutional requirement for an introduction vote. And that introduction vote means that before it even starts the process, the very first thing it needs to do is get 40 people to say, 40 people in the house to say, yes, we, we think this bill is worthy of our time to, to get going into the process. And that is a high bar, right? So the, the bar to pass the bill is only 31, a majority. And so we have a two thirds requirement just to have the bill even be considered at all. And if it, if it hits that high bar of 40 votes, then it goes into, uh, it gets referred to a committee. A committee will discuss it, a house committee will discuss it. If the house committee decides to approve it for the full floor, um, it'll come to the, the floor of the house where uh, it needs 31 people to get passed as a um, bill through the house. And so that has to go through three separate readings um, where if it succeeds in that, it'll get sent to the Senate to do the same thing except for the introduction vote. The introduction vote is only in the House of Origin. So last year, we didn't have this introduction vote. It only happens during budget sessions. So just to make that clear, this 40 vote margin is something that only happens during the shorter session where we discuss the budget. Thank you. Um, Senator Nethercott, last year, Healthy Wyoming uh, was successful in passing Medicaid legislation through the House. Unfortunately, that legislation died in the Senate um, can you tell us about some of the hurdles that you see for Medicaid expansion and, and possibly any suggestions on how to make this campaign successful? Yes, so I know, um, you know, I've spoken to a number of um, stakeholders here in Laramie County in, in recent weeks to discuss the topic of Medicaid expansion, which I know is so important to so many Wyomingites across the state, um, approximately 20,000. You know, and unfortunately, I've been I've been quite candid in a way that I, I hope constituents in Wyoming have learned to expect from me that I don't think Medicaid expansion is going to pass this year again and, and likely result um, again in a stalling out in the Senate. The reason for that is a majority of the Senate does not support Medicaid expansion. And so the same senators who were there, you know, last January um, are still there today. And since that time, it doesn't appear like anything profound has happened that would shift those priorities from where they have been. Um, you know, those legislators, those senators have been focused on other topics and certainly Medicaid expansion hasn't been able to come to the forefront as a result of ARPA funds and redistricting and the pandemic, that it just hasn't been that kind of priority. So that's, you know, you never know what happens in a legislative session and I don't wanna take away that hope, but I just, I see that um, for where our priorities are and where really the bulk of our work lays in front of us, Medicaid expansion is probably gonna be a very, very heavy lift. The reason why my understanding a majority of those senators don't support it and, and in full disclosure, um, you know, in, when I first ran for Senate in 2016, I campaigned that I supported Medicaid expansion. Um, depending on which version of the bill, I likely would support it again and with the right parameters and, and protections in place. Um, so, so that's where I stand on Medicaid expansion, but my colleagues, um, you know, have those same concerns that I don't think are new arguments that, that I'm sure most of this audience is aware of. And one is, um, you know, the argument that we, we estimate right now that there would be approximately 15 to 20,000 Wyomingites who would uh, benefit from Medicaid expansion and have access to healthcare who are the working poor. They believe in looking at sister states that those numbers grow exponentially. Um, and they frequently cite to Utah. I think there's probably a variety of factual considerations there. Uh, I think there's concerns about growing government and getting us on a trajectory that we can't get out of, where we're having to, to continually fund 
um, the costs associated with Medicaid expansion when we don't have the resources. Uh, and so some of those concerns um, continue to perpetuate themselves. Some of them do see it um, as welfare as opposed to uh, kind of identifying a healthcare gap for the working poor. Uh, and they're just fundamentally ideologically will not move from that position. Then unfortunately, what I think has happened on the topic of Medicaid expansion is it's become painfully partisan. And as a result of that, some of the underlying factual debates or policy considerations aren't being meaningfully heard as a result of it becoming just so partisan. Uh, and so I, I fear its success this session, particularly in light of these other challenges the legislature has been experiencing. I appreciate your honesty, um, and I also appreciate your support for this effort. Um, I do have a question from the audience. Gail, this one is directed to you. As a conservative with a dash of libertarianism, can you explain your reasons for supporting Medicaid expansion? Yes, thank you. So uh, I look at the people that are that that this expansion would cover, and I think about every time I go out to eat and, and somebody is, is, is waiting on me and I'm thinking, this is a person who doesn't have medical coverage um, or you know, in any number. I, I, you look at a small business and particularly in the service industry because that's where I think the, the working poor really are. And, and these people are really the backbone of of, uh, of our communities in, in many, many ways. Uh, but but from, a, from an economic standpoint, uh, our hospital here in Sheridan has to write off millions and millions every year because they cannot turn people away. And so where previously the CEO of Sheridan County Memorial had been against it, uh, they re-looked at it. The hospital uh, association has re-looked at it and said, wait a minute, this, this just makes good fiscal sense in terms of uh, being able to keep these, these strapped and stressed uh, healthcare providers going. So I, I agree that it does create more of that trajectory on, on dependence but the way to address that is not to pretend like people don't need healthcare. It's to say, why is healthcare so blessed expensive in Wyoming? Because if we could, if we could find ways to reduce the cost for everybody, there would be less of a need to, to fill that gap. And, and so just changing how much people pay doesn't change the underlying cost of providing that. And so when, um, when Sheridan Memorial has to write that much off, guess who gets to cover that loss? It gets spread to the insurers and the other individuals who can. So it's getting covered. That cost is being covered. It's just hidden because it is, it's being embedded in, in how they're getting uh, reimbursed uh, for their costs. So uh, yeah, I, you know, the, the, the conservatism is, is more about being pragmatic and, and saying, what's the true cost? And, and the true cost is, is pretty difficult on our people. It's difficult on our healthcare providers. And I really would like to see more of a look at what needs to be done to imp in improve the, the, the cost basis for all healthcare, not how much we pay in, in dividends or, or you know, the, the insurance, but why does it cost so much to run a hospital? Why does it cost so much to run a doctor's office? That's where we need to do some savings. Well, thank you for those comments and thank you for the question from the audience. I think that, you know, there are arguments to be made that those costs are eventually borne by the consumer and by the taxpayer. So one way or other, we're all ending up paying for this anyway. Um, ESPC will continue to advocate for Medicaid expansion and that will be a top priority until the state passes it. 
Uh, there is a rally on February 14th at the Capitol uh, for Medicaid expansion. So if you're in Cheyenne and this is something that you support, please do join us uh, in front of the Capitol at 1230. Well, we're getting close to the end. Um, so what I'm gonna do is give each of you about a minute to tell me what um, your hopes are for the budget session. And, and it really can be anything, it can be inspirational. Um, Helen, I'm gonna put you on the spot too. I know you're not from Wyoming, but we'd love to hear your thoughts. So um, we'll go alphabetically with first name. So Gail, you'll go first. Okay, thank you. So uh, I, as a part of Civics 307, every evening I update a tracker and it's civics, C-I-V-I-C-S 307.com. And it, I basically track every single piece of legislation through every step of the process um, so that people can, can track what theirs are doing. And when it comes to the idea of, of giving, letting your people know, your, your legislators and all, I want to give a quote from Edmund Burke, who's kind of the father of conservatism. And, um, and again, it's, it's my conservative basis. I'm not a populist conservative. And he, he wrote uh, a couple hundred years ago, he was a, an Irishman um, who was a, a, a statesman. Your representative owes you, not his industry only, but judgment. And he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinions. And so when you may not get the outcome you want from your representatives, understand that they listen to all of the, the, the people speak, they listen to all sides, and they're really there to provide their judgment. And so I, I just urge people to remember that quote. I think it's one of the best when it comes to a representative democracy. Thank you, Gail. Helen, you're gonna come next. So what are you hoping for the Wyoming State Legislature in the budget, budget session in the next month? Sure. So I normally what I think is really important to emphasize is that as you know, citizens of Wyoming, voters in Wyoming, you should have a say, you're meant to have a say in how in what the districts look like in Wyoming. I will admit, I don't know exactly where Wyoming is in the process of maybe already having had public input or if there will be opportunity for any more. I'm sorry, I'm I'm out of the loop on that. But when it comes to redistricting or other elections policies, when it comes to split ballots in counties or ballot access, mail-in voting, any sort of election issue that you think could work differently or perhaps could work better in Wyoming, you should folks should never hesitate to make their voices heard to your representatives. I think the Senator hit the nail on the head. These folks are in office because they want to hear what's important to their constituents. And, you know, I just like to encourage people don't tell yourself that you don't know enough about politics or it's too complicated or it's too hard to make your voices heard for what you think is best for your state. That's everybody's role, everybody's right to be able to do that. So take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you so much and thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, Representative Yin, you're next. What are your hopes and dreams for the next month? Um, I have I have a lot of them. Uh, you know, I think, I think because this is something that happens every 10 years and it, it will affect the next 10 years, I do hope that we pass a map that fulfills our constitutional obligations, frankly, um, because I think those are the obligations that are most important for uh, making sure that the people are well represented. Um, with the budget, you know, I I I would like to see a, a, a better pay raise for employees. I want to make sure that the real wage, so a wage adjusted for inflation, is one that actually shows an increase rather than. Um, even if we have an increase, if it doesn't match inflation, then we've still done a disservice to your state employees. And my community specifically um, has a housing issue that has been exacerbated 10 times because of the, the, the pandemic. And so uh, we have a bill for an optional, a county optional tax, and that will be my, frankly, my number one priority um, going in as well. Last but not least, Senator Nethercott, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Well, thank you. Um, my hopes and dreams for the session are actually quite limited. Um, I know we'll pass a good budget. Uh, we, we actually always do that and we're, we're pretty good at doing that. And so I feel confident about our abilities to pass a budget that recognizes um, the hard work of our state employees. 
um, and makes many of our public services whole again in light of the, the challenges they faced historically. You know, beyond that, uh, I of course share Representative Yen's concerns that that we pass a redistricting plan that fulfills our constitutional obligations, and and I'm confident that we will. Um, it's just the process in which we end up getting there, in addition to all of the other topics that we see before us, that despite these conflicts and the frustrations that we're able to uh, increase the integrity of the institution, uh, ensure that there is fair decorum and we elevate um, the reputation uh, to make our constituents proud for what it means to be a public servant uh, serving in the Capitol. And I think, you know, uh, for those watching, um, to just recognize how difficult of a job it can be, how tired we can get, um, how um, personalities can flare. Um, so be thinking of us and, and sending us your prayers and good wishes uh, as we try to do what's best for the people of Wyoming and, and sacrifice a great deal during this next month. So my hope is that uh, we make you proud. That's a great uh, note to close on. Um, I just hope that everybody gets along um, and everybody stays healthy. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight to our panelists. You were wonderful. This was a great discussion. I appreciate your time and your expertise. To those of you watching, thank you so much for your support of ESPC and for attending tonight's event. Uh, next PR Live will be a legislative session wrap up. We will talk about the bills that were passed, the map that ends up being finalized, uh, and any key issues that come out of the budget. So we hope to see you then. I'm gonna turn it over to Celeste to close us out and hopefully we'll see you next month. Awesome, thank you so much, Jen. And thank you all for joining us this evening and taking the time to listen and share some really awesome discussion. Um, I would just like to share that the Equality State Policy Center is a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit organization. And as such, we rely on charitable gifts to fund our work. So donations can be made at our website, equalitystate.org, or you can mail a check to 419 South 5th Street, Laramie, Wyoming, 82070. Again, you can email me if you'd like to join our leadership circle donors, Marsha Constell and Joe Albright, Mike Shanzi and Kathy Jenkins. Joanne Sky, I'm true, and Shane True, and an anonymous donor. Our thanks to them for making tonight possible. And again, please don't forget to join us on Monday the 14th for the Medicaid Expansion Rally at the Capitol. So thank you again for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of your evening, and we see you again for our next People's Review Live.